Okay, I'm going to turn it over okay. to Fred Kala from JPL, who's going to talk a bit about establishing a Mars chronology and some of the challenges. This is something that is uh, near and dear to those of us who are actually on, like Fred and Barbara and myself, who are on the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover mission and thinking about this in terms of what samples you might need to get. So I'll turn it over to you, Fred, and uh, we will then move into a bit of a discussion after that. Okay, thanks. And I have uh, about 10 minutes. Give or take, yeah. Oh, okay, I think that, that was <laughs> what I heard was less. 10 to 15, yeah. <laughs> no, no problem. No, no, that's um, fine. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so um, so I'm gonna talk about some of the, um, you know, the, the ways we're dating surfaces on Mars and it, the challenges in doing that. Um, absent absolute dates like we have on the moon. And uh, I also want to very much thank um, Dr. Robert Cohen for, um, she, she's, no, she's known me long enough to know exactly what I'm going to talk about. So she kindly um, set things up for me. Um, so just a quick overview. You're on Mars and you want to know the age of a geologic unit. What do you do? Um, this is not Mars, actually. This is the moon, uh, but that's okay. Um, this is Mari uh, Chilskovsky crater on the moon. But what do you do? You outline a unit as they've done here in red. Uh, you count all the craters. And what that means is that you, you delineate where those craters are in their size ranges. And so then you get a ratio of the number of craters over a certain diameter um, over a unit area. And then you compare that to um, uh, previous work that was done on the moon to calibrate um, uh, an age, a, a date for a certain, a certain a surface, um, a geologic unit, when it's absolute geochronologic age, to this crater density, this number of craters per diameter bin of the crater per unit area. And then you get what we call these isochrons. Um, you know, so here's a three uh, giga year isochron age based on that relationship. And then here are the plots of those craters in the various uh, unit bins. So this is crater diameter at the bottom in a log scale. And this is the size frequency of those craters per unit area. So matching this up, it creates this nice kind of, uh, hopefully a, a uh, somewhat linear um, log log um, match to this isochron age. And then you, so then you get a time from that based on that fit to uh, that isochron. Um, so what do you do? So you, you have, you, we extrapolate to Mars. And so here's an example from uh, Grant et al. Um, looking at these, um, uh, the alluvial fan inside of Gale Crater, alluvial fan here, and then this, uh, this bright tone fractured unit. Um, so we delineated an area, you counted the craters on the surface, and then you, again, you match it to these isochron ages that have been established. Um, again, based on the crater diameter versus the, um, the accumulation rate of those craters over a unit area. And then, you know, this kind of shows what the problem is, is that um, sometimes the crater counts don't always fit to this line that we've established. Um, and, and these error bars are just showing the errors because of small counts. So um, there can be quite a variation. So like, what is the um, date that you would pick for this uh, particular surface? Um, that becomes a bit of a question, which I'm gonna go over. So let's go, <laughs> I'm gonna start like way back from the beginning and I apologize if I'm talking about things that you can explain way better than I can. But we went to the moon, we grabbed a bunch of samples and we have, uh, um, you know, we've gotten geochronologic, geochronologic ages from them through various methods. Um, I found this uh, particular um, sample interesting because it's a breccia and there's a little quote uh, on the top right, just saying that, you know, the breaches are breaches of breaches. So, you know, where is the age? Uh, Where's the date that you're getting from? Which minerals? How are you calling them together? Um, that's a whole thing that I, I don't have enough information uh, myself to talk about. But nevertheless, um, absolute ages were dated for the moon. Um, then we relate those ages, okay, ages at the bottom here. Um, to specific locations on the moon and their observed number of craters uh, of a certain size per unit area. And so, uh, so then you get this plot, um, which goes from, you know, um, you know, kind of old, you know, so we have a bunch of dates that are in kind of this three giga year area, and then it kind of jumps over to here, one giga year, and then going back, um, you know, uh, something closer to current. Um, so this, the, these uh, points were used to establish 
uh, basically a, a model function, and this is the Noicum chronology, which is frequently used as that start um, to fit through those points. Now, uh, interestingly, there have been recent authors have kind of uh, made their own versions of model age, but um, ignoring that little problem, uh, let's just say that we have this Noicum chronology, which is the moon um, establishing absolute ages of rocks to the number of craters per unit area on their surface. Now, how do you get that to Mars? Um, that is the tricky part. So um, going all the way back to uh, Hartman um, and his, um, his seminal work. Um, so you get this, this uh, function, this model of how the moon looks uh, it, and it's, its age isochron. And then you have to make two adjustments. One is um, called R boli. This is the ratio of impacts you could expect on Mars versus what you would expect at the moon. Um, because Mars is closer to the asteroid belt. Um, seems like a little bit of voodoo black magic to me, but there's some calculation that's done and that shifts the isochron age up and then uh, the isochron lines up. And then you also have to adjust because the fact that, uh, you know, uh, the, the impact velocities at Mars and the gravity of Mars is different. And so that winds up shifting the, uh, the isochrons to the left. So, um, you do obviously do it more than just my hand wavy version. And then uh, you can calculate these um, for certain diameter sizes, um, what, the, what the cumulative counts will be. And these have been divided up into, as um, uh, Chris had originally uh, talked about, um, Nowakian, and Hesperian and Amazonian ages. And then they plot up basically into these, these bins of years, which are then extrapolated um, down <laughs> uh, from these ages. And so you get four, you know, three gig a year, one gig a year, um, all the way even down to 10,000 years. Um, so most of the plots that you'll see on, on dating the crater retention age of a surface, which means how long has that surface collected those craters? Of course, that is different from the emplacement age of a unit and the lithification age of the unit. So you can imagine that, um, some environment, uh, rocks are deposited, and then um, a certain amount of time takes it before it's lithified to retain craters. And then that, from that point that it's, the surface is lithified, it, it accumulates those craters over, over some time. So really when we're plotting ages here, um, uh, crater counts on these lines, we're really trying to match up how long that surface was lithified and thereby retaining craters. Of course, it's not that simple because it's not like, um, you know, Mars is certainly more complicated than Moon in the sense that, um, you know, it's not like think something is put in place and then just craters accumulate over forever um, till the present day. Um, there's, you know, there's lots of water and ice interaction and wind interaction, which are both erase or um, cover up or exhume craters. And so all that gets thrown into the mix of this crater retention surface that you generate. Um, but it, it gets even trickier um, so we really have to look at, you know, what are the problems, um, what are the challenges of determining a chronology using uh, crater counting right now? Um, different versions of production functions, um, different chronologies that are established by um, a couple of different authors, although they're pretty close to each other. Um, where you establish these epoch boundaries, you know, what does Noachian mean? What does Hesperian mean, Amazonian? Where are the breaks? And some authors break them off at different time periods. Um, which kind of shifts around the kind of the very major um, uh, environments of Mars uh, in time. Uh, and then we get down to kind of the mechanics of um, what are the size of the craters that you're mapping? Um, what are the diameter that you're using? You know, so this is the N1, so this would be like all uh, craters uh, greater than a kilometer, greater than two kilometers. You know, depending on the size crater that you pick, you can actually get different um, ages, different dates for your surfaces. Um, the randomness and cratering patterns that, you know, you, you, you can get random clusters um, or random dis, dis, uh, dispersedness of craters. So the size of the unit area that you pick, um, cratering get, the, the, the age you can get is different. Um, and certainly in geologic mapping, like what is the surface? Is it a volcanic unit? Is it something that would be, um, you know, emplaced in once or how many episodes of um, different um, episodes has it seen, you know? hasn't been buried by some fluvial action later, has it been exhumed by a billion years of um, alien activity? Um, has it then been reworked by, you know, insert process? Um, and then just, again, this interpretation of how we go from, 
you know, model ages, which are, are they formation? Are they retention of craters? Um, and how, how close are they, those together? Okay. Um, so um, we have some erosion rates from Mars and they go anywhere from uh, as low as three nanometers per year up to um, hundreds, uh, 100 plus nanometers per year. And that doesn't sound like a lot, um, but when we start to look at billions of years of accumulation, um, it, it starts to matter. So here's, um, uh, this is a work by Palusas and Dietrich looking at erosion rates on crater size diameters. So uh, what happens when you, when you start to change, um, when you put these erosion rates in, so here's like no erosion, 10 nanometers, here's um, uh, 100 nanometers uh, of uh, erosion per year. And then when you measure a smaller geologic unit, your dates start to get um, essentially uh, younger um, because you've started to eroded these smaller craters and thereby you see less of them. And you've broken the assumption that these craters are there forever. They're not, you know, we have an atmosphere on Mars. Um, and so again, here's another um, modeling by uh, Smith, Gillespie and Montgomery, um, just showing when you, when you increase the um, erosion rates, um, you do start to deflect these actual isochrons, the actual number of craters that you would count and thereby, um, you know, you might have a count here, which normally you would have said was 10 million years, but it may actually represent a three giga year surface, simply because you're counting only small craters and thereby um, you're not really um, capturing the, the, the true number of craters over that unit time because it's, it's not a surface that's just existing in a, in a atmosphereless um, uh, isolated state. Um, uh, again, going back to the size area. So just, um, this is a work by uh, Warner et al. looking at basically how big of an area do you need? And then what happens to the um, age of that surface as you um, change the, the size of the area? You go from 10,000 square kilometer, you know, 100,000 square kilometers to 10,000 square kilometers to 100 square kilometers and how that affects the various um, ages that you might expect. So in some case, so as you get smaller, basically you, you, your variance of, of the ages that you can get um, um, becomes very wide. So you can get a, you can measure a very small area and get a, an age that, that you know, um, could be uh, Noachian or could be Amazonian. Um, you know, it could be 3 billion years or it could be 1 billion years. And depending on where you sample because of the kind of um, random clustering of small craters, especially, um, you might see a lot of craters or you might see none. Um, or the area is so small, you, like this area here, you can't capture this whole, this large crater, right? You could be in the middle of that crater and not realize that, um, you know, you're really on a three giga year surface, but you only see the Amazonian craters that have landed in this small area. Um, so lots of edge effects that happen. And so again, here's just showing those age ranges that show that um, here's a hundred kilometer square area. You get a 3.6 giga year age. Um, you increase it to 10,000, uh, I think that's a 10,000, yeah, 10,000 uh, square kilometers. You're actually looking at that as a resurfacing age by some event and the actual age of the surface is four giga years. I'm um, gonna keep going on. Um, so, and also what do we determine a unit to be? Um, it's, it's deposition environment. Here's a cratered surface, um, which is flat. And from orbit, you probably say looks volcanic. Um, look at the surface. Here is Gusev Crater. We know Gusev Crater is a volcanic surface. We see wrinkle ridges. We see all the fun volcanic features that we would expect for a, a um, extensive lava flow. Those what those rocks look like. Here's this cratered surface on Gale. Um, quick eyeball, looks kind of the same, except when you get really, really, really close. And then you see that these, this fine layer, these, this uh, really basically decimeter scale, um, uh, uh, cap of rocks um, has cross bedding in it. It is a sedimentary rock. Now, perhaps volcanic classic sedimentary. Um, that's not necessarily decided, but it was. It is a sedimentary rock. It is not volcanic in emplacement. Um, at least, at least not um, a lava flow. So you have to be very careful about what crater retaining surfaces look like. What is um, volcanic? What is not? In terms of like, would you would you pick these rocks to date them? and in a sample return mission, and would they be the right rocks to pick or would you want to get something else? Um, okay, I can see I'm running way over. 
So uh, the 2020 mission is, um, you know, we want to get rocks to establish um, uh, a crater chronology that we can match to an actual um, uh, uh, date, geochronologic date from units in the crater, um, from Jezero Crater. Um, we have this thing that we've uh, forever has been called a volcanic unit covering the, the floor. It looks like it's about 3.45 gig years in age. Of course, um, those ages um, do differ a little bit. Um, here's where we landed in Jezero Crater, the white dot. Here's the samples we're going to collect. Um, you know, which ones should we bring back? Which are the most important ones for dating? Um, cool thing is that we do have what we think are mega breaches um, near Jezero Crater. So we have a very well-established um, crater date um, for the larger Isidus impact. So we can get this large end of the uh, crater chronology from Mars. If we can get back a sample, we have these mega blocks, which are mega breccia blocks, which we can um, grab um, as we exit Jezero Crater and you know, potentially bring some of those samples back so we can be dating Isidus impact heights, um, breccias. We also have the olivine carbon unit, which is very extensive, covers a large area. Um, and it's, uh, let's see, da, 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 its date is, uh, I think it's on the next page, like 3.82. Yeah, there it is from Mandan. Um, very extensive. So lots of craters we can count. We can link to a very specific geologic unit. We can sample and return. Um, uh, again, here's the gouge at alls. You know, it, his dates range from 3.45, but this also this volcanic unit on the floor has also had much younger dates on the unit. On the unit, so um, so there's a there's a two gig year variation on who, depending on who measures the surface, what the absolute chronologic age is. And so, just to touch on a few things, you know, what are we trying to quantify with samples? Um, you know, it this sample, you know, from this geologic unit. How many craters has it retained since it's been lithified? And then, um, you know, what does that lithification mean? You know, uh, you know, if, if this is a weakly lithified unit, you know, you may not be retaining enough small craters. If you're counting a small area, maybe only you're seeing small craters. Um, uh, if the outcrop is hard, well lithified, it should retain lots of craters of all sizes. But we see variations in some of these volcanic units depending on where you look. Um, if the outcrop is weak or we, is, is soft or weakly lithified, but undergoes later weathering that then makes it harden, what the crater count may be is just the, the point at which that crater surface was hard enough to retain craters and that might be later. So you might see a mix of crater um, uh, sizes on a surface. Um, so what do we need? We need to know the lithology and mineralogy of the, what size minerals are present. We can get that from our SuperCam, Pixel and Sherlock instruments or at least <laughs> some version thereof. Um, you know, if we see evidence of diagenesis, um, is this good or is this bad? You know, what are we dating in the rocks? Are we dating the crystallization age of the minerals? Are we dating the cements, which link those minerals together? Probably, probably both in some cases for a sedimentary rock, in which cases we get kind of an age range. And then, you know, here's a bunch of examples of rocks we're seeing on Mars with the, with the Perseverance rover. Um, which would you pick, right? Stuff that's in place or stuff you think is in place, would float be okay if you knew where it came from? You know, what are those assumptions? And I think that's it. Thank you, Fred, appreciate that. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. And I think just to follow up, it seems like um, uh, that, well, this is the discussion that is going on, obviously will be going on uh, with, within uh, Perseverance as to the suitability of this crater floor unit for, for geochronology. But, your your other examples that you gave it seemed like to, maybe uh, what what are your thoughts on it's, you started with Isidus Basin right in terms of an yes. example of what we could do is would that be for you sort of more the, a better target a better sort of event to try to to date that could put a pinning point on that absolute chronology. Um, uh... I, I, I actually, I, I think the, you know, if you want to put a point, I think the olivine carbonate unit is probably the best because it's a widespread deposit. Um, it covers a large area. We, we know, we know what rocks relate specifically, um, uh, at least at the moment that would, that would go to, um, you know, a, a large geologic unit that is collected craters. Now, it's true Isidus has this um, large area where we have crater counts, but uh, to me, it's like we're sampling ejecta blocks. Um, we're, I, I don't want to necessarily, um, the, the literature seems that 
we're convinced that these megabretcher blocks have to be from Isidus. Hopefully that's true. Um, you know, you could have right. some debate there. Those, those are, you know, again, like they're ejector blocks. They're not blocks. And you're not sampling Isidus basement um, or, or, you know, you're sampling a disconnected block. So is that, right. is that um, definitively yeah. Isidus? Um, I think most people would right. say, uh, the, the literature says yes. And hopefully that's true. But then like, what if this is a breccia of a breccia? Right, like, right, right. like you yeah. might get a range of ages, and what does that mean? So, um, the olivine current year to me, I think, is the best. Um, is it just uh, ejectable mega breccia? Probably the next best, but really cool because then you get like this time separation, right, of those events. Yeah. Um, and then there's the crater floor, and 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 I think the the um, the, the quote unquote volcanic unit, um, which uh, you know, is it volcanic or you not? And you know, we don't actually know yet. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah, so and the, and the, I mean, there are assumptions. I think it's really interesting because there are assumptions involved in all of these. Like you said, can we find a megabritcha block that is directly a link, linkable to Isidus? Even within that block, is there something that we could define that could be directly linked? Um, there may be, uh, yeah, I mean, another possibility is do we find any impact, just sort of speaking in the general realm of impact craters, do we find any impact uh, related um, effects in the crater rim of Jezero, for example, that we could use mm -hmm. to date Jezero itself. Um, but then the olivine carbonate unit, this one that, I mean, for people who don't know, has a signature of olivine, has a hint of a magnesium carbonate from orbit. We don't exactly know what rock type it is, but it's, it can be mapped over the area and into Jezero itself. You know, there are assumptions about that too, that, that it was, you know, that it's a, it's a, conformable unit essentially right that it was laid down or by whatever means at at a particular in a particular relatively short amount of time so that and has retained those craters ever since and and as you mentioned in your talk the you know you make these assumptions in terms of what what you're actually going to uh what what the sample that you get from that is going to what geo geochronological information it's going to give you any other thoughts, uh, comments on this? I know we're, we're at the top of the hour now, but if we, we will record this too, so people can can also uh, yes. and can participate through that uh, that other website that James mentioned at the beginning. Yeah, uh, can I just jump in and so, say, mm -hmm. Fred, that was great. For someone who's not on the NASA twenty twenty team, that was really good to hear more about that. Um, can I just take things back to the moon because you know there's from the work I've done on lunar rocks, you know, there's so few of the basins that we have any confidence in their age. So, I mean, how much does it matter whether, you know, Serenitatis is 3.9 or 4.2, or, you know, we changed the age of some of those major lunar basins. How does that affect the crater chronology on the moon, let alone on Mars? Uh, so just, um ignoring um when we get samples back right and, and, and establishing the dates um i think it it could depending on the the confidence interval of those dates like it, it could start to shift those um the mars isochrons are around because you're 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 kind of changing that link um uh you know through the chronology like you saw like there's a bunch of steps for us to get what we call an absolute uh, age on Mars, an absolute uh, surface uh, crater retention age. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know um, the exact like how much it would shift. It was you know like you said like between 3.9 and and 4.1. Maybe 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 it's like super in the noise or in the noise of our sampling method. Anyways, um, I do think you know there is still this disparity of like you know there's a two billion year age gap between you know. The youngest, the, the the lunar rocks, you know, from from you go from three to, to one, and so it would nice to know what's going on around two. Um, you know, what is the shape of that curve? Um, there, you know, the, and, and but I, I think mostly a, a lot of the the problem I think hinges on this moon to Mars ratio, as uh, David Schuster uh, <laughs> would be saying right now if he was talking. I mean, some of the slides he he, he um, contributed to um, that I pulled from. Um, so knowing those ratios, I probably are more important. Um, but then as you can tell, tell that's just like, there's so much, like maybe like redating the moon samples, um, samples from the moon wouldn't help. Wouldn't, maybe that wouldn't correct everything, but it, it certainly doesn't hurt. But 
there. There's a lot of squishiness. Well, so I think they, they think the cool part is like bring back samples. Like we actually be able to establish, um, you know, its own independent um, view of um, surface ages to um, crater retention. And, and I think that's, that's really the, the key thing that we might be able to break that chain and establish our own um, new foundation. Right, that's a good point. The other thing to note is that Changa 5 just brought back samples from a relatively young Mari area mm. too. So there may be insights, you know, that in terms of, uh, of uh, what James is talking about with sort of refining the lunar, the lunar curve as well. Any other questions or comments? It's been really useful. Thank you, Fred. Yeah, I mean, just picking up on what, what James is saying, I think that, you know, whether a, a basin formed at 3.9 or 4.1, you know, it changes the crater curve, but it also, uh, one of the things we talk about with basins on the moon, obviously, is its effect on life on Earth. And so that that interval of, of heavy bombardment is absolutely crucial for understanding you know, life on Mars too. So those are maybe small changes, but they may be big effects if you're adding a lot of mass. The, the time between huge bombardments is huge. Yeah, that's, I mean, absolutely, I, I completely agree. And just to add to that, I mean, um, Gabe mentioned the Moser-led paper, um, which sort of suggested that some, at least, an aspect of the, the heaviest bombardment on Mars must have been over by like four GA, I think, if I remember that paper correctly. So I think it was even older. Yeah, I, I, that's why I'm being a bit cautious, but yeah, it's even perhaps even older. So, I mean, that's quite different from what we currently think about the moon, right? So in terms of the, the bombardment history of both planets could be quite different as far as we know at the moment, right? That's one of the assumptions that goes into, as Fred was saying, that's one of the assumptions that goes into extending it from the, the chronology from the moon to Mars. Yeah. So there's a comment in the chat from Ian Coulson, which is, you know, another angle to this we'd love to be able to answer uh, about, you know, identifying potential ejection sites for the Martian meteorites. Um, you know, I guess the question turns into, like, is there anything we could dream of doing that would help us to achieve that? Well, we've uh, I've been working on that a bit with some colleagues um, because there's some recent modeling that's been able to um, uh, kind of refine the link between the damage that we get, the, the shock effects in the meteorites, especially in in um, the veins where you get a high pressure polymorph, because then you can get the basically the pressure, temperature, time, history, and in particular the dwell time, the the, the amount of time that the rock spent at peak pressure. And the dwell time is part of forward modeling that's been done in a paper by Bowling et al. 2020 that can link that to uh, to a to the spallation zone, you know, in this this way that these are ejected from Mars. And so the and and the the main sort of uh, uh, connection that's been made now is you can now determine a range of potential impactor sizes that can generate a set an ejected sample with a particular dwell time. So that means that we can start to narrow down the number of craters that could be the sources of the Martian meteorites. And when you couple that with the fact that we know they're from Amazonian igneous terrains, you know, almost certainly around Elysium or or, um, or um, Tharsis, that that and they must be based on cosmic ray exposure ages. They must be, you know, at most 20 million years, so very young, relatively fresh impact craters, you can start to narrow down the number of craters that they could be from. So we're looking at that. There's other ways of sort of approaching this question. I think we're getting closer. Um, there's some other work that we're doing that, that you know, indicates that we could be looking at a handful or we've sort of identified a handful of, of fresh craters on those surfaces that, that are the potential sources of the meteorites. The challenge becomes, and it comes back to what Monaco mentioned, if you've got a stack of, of uh, a whole bunch of meteorites that are from the same ejection event, then the surface that you're dating is that you the, the the surface that that you can link it to the surface age is going to be, the unit age I should say is going to be that of the youngest uh, meteorite presumably in the stack or one of the youngest ones. So there's a little bit of uncertainty there, but there I think I think we're getting closer. There's a potential. It's going to be maybe one additional data point. 
um, in that. But it is also the other thing to recognize is that the age range of the middle to late Amazonian is kind of where a lot of the uncertainty is, right? The few hundred million year, if you look at those curves. So if we could do that, it, as you say, it would be ideal. It, it would actually give us an additional data point that we can use to, um, to, to calibrate the chronology. Any other questions, comments? Well, I would say if uh, hopefully uh, I've got lots of um, people in the chat saying they've enjoyed the talks. I have certainly myself. I think it's been really interesting, and uh, certainly uh, uh, James, I think you'll agree, done the done the job of covering those things that we wanted to cover in the workshop. Um, do you want to add anything else? I mean, I've, my brain is full of things I want to do now, right? So I've, I've jotted, down, I've jotted down a list of people I want to talk to a bit more. Um, and that's, you know, what these things are about, really. It's kind of finding out what people are up to, uh, you know, new ideas, new uh, new schemes as well. So look forward to following up on those. Well, yeah. And so thank you to all our speakers. Um, thank you to Kevin Murphy for the technical assistance. Uh, the and the Mineralogical Society and the Meteorological Society for, for support. <laughs>